Good evening. You're watching The Iconographer, and we've got a great show for you tonight. We've got a very special guest whom I'm very excited about. He's a poet, a playwright, he's a writer, he's a theatre researcher. He's also a professor of comparative literature at UNAM in Mexico. His name is Gabriel Weiss Carrington. He's also the son of one of the most famous and celebrated women painters and novelists of the 20th century, Leonora Carrington. It's a great pleasure to have him with us tonight. Now, if you have any highly intelligent questions, please do share them. You can post them in the chat or you can appear live on our platform and we'll be delighted to have you. Thank you, Gabriel, for being with us. Thank you, Cheyenne, for inviting me. You wrote a book called The Invisible Painting, and the soft cover has just appeared on the market. I think it's a fantastic book. It's about your relationship with your mother. It really gives a good impression of how, of what it was like to live with your mother, with Leonora. Could you maybe sort of concisely tell us what the book is about and what motivated you to write it? Well, you know, uh, I was not going to write this uh, at first because, uh, I don't know, I was kind of, I kind of hesitated. But when people uh, began writing about Leonora, trying to create a myth, no, a mythical figure out of her, I thought, well, now is the time to sort of go directly into the subject and speak about what she really was as a person, you know, and as an artist. Because people like, you know, the kind of melodrama behind it or the sex story, and they always devaluate uh, her as a woman, you no, know, and as a woman artist, most importantly. No? Yes. Now, what do you think previous writers and previous commentators got wrong about Leonora? What, what exactly did you want to rectify? Well, they were far more in, uh, interested in gossip, no? uh, because it sells well, hmm. uh, but it also devaluates the person, you know, and her art. So I, I wanted to open up a door no, it, it, with my limitations, uh, on how important she was for the art world and and as a person. No, how she worked through her books. No, uh, uh, what uh, uh, she was trying to discover within herself, and uh, how her problems were solved through her art as well. No, it was a kind of art therapy of sorts. No, hmm? yes, because she has re received uh, a lot of deserved attention lately. Finally, I think, um, of course, Joanna Moorhead, who's a relative of yours, she also wrote a book. What, what, what did you feel you could add to the narrative about her life that hadn't been said in that in that book, for example? Well, I think I was. Uh a bit more interested in the techniques that Leonora was using you know, for her own work. Because like that, I felt I was getting closer to what the person was. You know? Leonora it was continuously trying to explore ideas in her art and in her person as well. Mm. And this is something that I think... Uh, uh, sort of is sort of brought up in in the book and naturally my life with her w w was a long one no she lived till she was 92 and so uh, and uh, that's a sort of uh, uh, atmosphere i wanted to convey no yeah one of the great things about your book i think and why people should read it it, it has various dimensions. So you start off telling her life before you were born. You, you're talking about her, uh, you know, growing up in England in a very sort of restricted atmosphere and about how she met your father, which I think we should talk about a bit more. And then you, you tell 
talk about growing up with your mother, but then you also dive into the sort of spiritual side of her and the discussions you had. And th that gives the book a lot of sort of rich depth, which I really appreciate. But just to return to the subject of, of your parents, how exactly did they meet? Because they were both refugees who met in Mexico, I believe, in 1944. Did, did they ever tell you how they met exactly? Not really. You know, the thing is that uh, I know that most people like to dramatize, you know, the first moment they met and this and that, no? Uh, my parents were not like that, no? Huh? They sort of tried to live in the moment and that was it, no? Huh? Yes. The past was past, no? So they would speak about what they were doing and what they were thinking uh, in the present, no? Hmm? Mm. That was one of the things. Now, it, it, as I don't know if you know this, but uh, Leonora was able to live leave uh, Portugal, no, with uh, uh, with Leduc, no, Renato Leduc, who was a Mexican poet and who was in the Mexican embassy, and that's the way she could flee Portugal huh, and and arrive to Mexico as a refugee. But then she divorced uh, Renato and, and, and she met my, my father. I think it was in a, during a party, one of those things, no? A small reunion, right? Yes. Well, that is something that I need to ask you about because in the book, it very clearly emerges that this was a marriage of convenience. Leonora had to escape the country and Renato was the right person at the right time. Um, but they were married for some time, weren't they? So was there, did your mother ever talk about this? Was there a degree of actual love or affinity? Yes, there was. I mean, you know, they were very close and, and, and she always, always spoke uh, uh, in a very loving way about, about Renato, no? Hmm? And he was a close friend throughout, so... You know, he would come visit the house and so on. We had long chats. And, and I had a special kind of relationship with him because my mother was afraid that I was going to a Vietnam demonstration. No? So she asked Renato to give me some advice no? because well, Renato was very politically oriented and so on. So the only thing she said, uh, he said, was, was watch those bastards of the police, no? The, the, the completely unreliable, no? That was it. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you so close your eyes, because it's Renato, because we know many of these other so great figures of surrealism, but what Renato was like is less clear in my own mind, because he's not very familiar to me. So if you close your eyes and you go back to that cafe where you met and where he gave you advice, and what, what, what kind of person was that? That, that previous hu previous husband of your mother, what, what kind of spirit did he have? Well, uh, you know, we basically spoke about, about politics, but I knew that he was a very warm person, you no, know, and very sincere. He was always very open about himself, very uh, self-critical. He was not a pretentious person at all, you no. Know? So it was very easy to speak with Renato because uh, it was always a, a, a kind of direct conversation, no? It was not yes. guarded uh, uh, and so on. So, so it was, he was always a very fascinating person as far as I was concerned, no? And if you were to describe, his, describe him, Renato, as, as an animal, which animal would he be? A bear came to mind. <laughs> Why? Well, because it, because they are reliable in a way, but only if you know them. No? <laughs> That's very good. That's very funny because the same animal came to my mind, even though I'd only seen pictures of him and read your account. That's interesting. So um, I want to get a sense of what it is like to have such a creative spirit as a mother. Um, 
So one book that I read some time ago by Esther Villar is called The Manipulated Man. She wrote it in 1971. It's a kind of anti-feminist book. And she says, and I quote, if there's anything a woman loads, it is having to play with children. Children are curious about absolutely everything, but it is difficult for a mother to enter the adventurous world of a child, unlike the father who cannot stop playing with the son's model railway. Now, I, I feel reading your book, this was slightly the reverse in your, your household. Leonora was very playful and she would actually really engage with you. C could you give the viewers a, a bit of a sense what it was like growing up with her? Well, what was very interesting was that she was always very generous, no? So, uh, you know, she did invite me uh, to collaborate. So we collaborated in the theater, we collaborated in a film, uh, we collaborated in, in making, you know, sculpture. And, and many other things. I mean, it was sort of a very interesting relationship in that sense because it was always being nourished by the, by the, by the creative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, she respected my way of, of doing things. And, of course, I admired very much what she was doing, no? So there was a direct communication there, but also uh, we went together with a with a Buddhist monk, and 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 we learned a lot of things from the Bardo Todo, that's to say the the Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. No, so there were many experiences that came up like that. No. And uh, she was always very open. She always included me in, in whatever her uh, environment was, either it being a creative one or a playful one, uh, etc. No, we spoke a lot about books that we shared and that uh, we were curious about. No, so th that was a sort of uh, relationship. It was more. Uh, you know, friendship, no? Yes. More than anything else, no? I, I, felt, I felt reading the book that you had a very liberal childhood and that your mother, when you came home from school, you, you write that she would give you a wine, I believe, diluted somewhat with sugar, but still it would make you very dizzy, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, well, that was in yeah. France, no? That yes, was when right. we were living in France and... Uh, and before going to school, actually, we were very, I was very small. I was about, what, maybe uh, four years old or something like that. So, yes, the wine was very diluted, right? It was not the kind of very strong stuff at all, no? Uh, and there were not as many prohibitions as nowadays, no? Nowadays, mm. I feel that adults are extremely puritanical about the upbringing no hmm? yes yes that's true now what about your father because obviously it's a book about your mother and your relationship to your mother um but but because of that I, i've slightly gotten the impression that your father was slightly less present in your life than your mother or is this totally incorrect no 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 he was present i mean uh you know again uh the channel of uh, uh, communication and so on was books and photography as well because uh, he wanted me to to be a photographer uh, but he didn't force me into that at all no so sometimes I would uh, accompany him uh, during his uh, photo sessions in different places and so on and um, we could speak about philosophy, something that my mother uh, disliked enormously. So there were some themes that I could speak uh, uh, with with my father. For example, I was interested in anarchism, and since he was an anarchist, well, we had a lot of uh, conversations on that matter and a way of behaving like an anarchist as well. No. <laughs> which philosophers did you discuss? Which ones did you tell about? 
oh, everybody, no, from Nietzsche to Heidegger to, you know, Hegel, uh, uh, a lot of other people, <laughs> well. Marx even, no? Marx, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think was the most important lesson that your parents gave you? Liberty. A, a love for freedom and not just your own liberty, but also respecting other people's liberty, presumably. Of course, of yes. course. I don't yes. think one can be free without uh, observing, you know, uh, the freedom of others. And that includes people who, who are feared because they're supposedly terrorists or, or they're blacks or they're homosexual or they're lesbian, etc., etc., etc. No, we live in a in a sort of proto-fascist atmosphere everywhere. No, and I don't like that. I oppose that profoundly. No. And do you think your mother would have agreed with that sentiment? Of course, of course, of course. No, everybody. You know, the house was open to everybody, uh, excluding fascists. No. <laughs> Uh, is liberty also, do you think, because the wonderful thing about your mother's paintings is that obviously she put a lot of thought in them, but she allows other people to think about them and reflect on them, so she doesn't prescribe what others should read into them. But do you think that liberty was a theme in her paintings as well? Yes, I think she couldn't have possibly created what she what she has, no, as, a, as, as her works of art and so on, without this sense of inner freedom. Why? Because she was experimenting with everything. She would not stop, no? Uh, maybe she disliked things that she would, uh, you know, in a very personal way, she would uh, make commentaries to me when we were at a museum and so on about some art that we were uh, we were watching together but but that was very personal when she would speak and people would ask what was her opinion on x or y artist she said that uh, that uh, she did not have any opinion on any artist at all no yes now Despite this sort of love for liberty that was instilled in you and the friendship you had with both your parents, one theme that really seemed very prominent in the book is escapism. So <coughs> you talk about reading books like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you talk about going to the cinema and then not remembering what you watched because you were so involved with the, the plot of the film. You talk about sitting, being summoned to the headmistress's office because you'd be naughty, and, and, and comparing it to being in, like, in an aqu aquarium, and you could hear the, the children shout distantly. So I feel like escapism was a very prominent theme. Why do you think that was in your childhood? Did that have anything to do with your upbringing? Yes. Well, you know, the, that moment that you were mentioning, it was the headmistress that punished me because, uh, well, because basically I was a rebel, and I didn't like any kind of discipline, and uh, I would take exception to that, no? So she put me into her, well, she, actually, she, she, she locked me into her office, no? And I could see the other children, but it became sort of an interesting experiment because I could see, you know, uh, the, the other children, like in a zoo or in a in an aquarium, no, huh? mm -hmm. where and I could imagine things, and so I amused myself by doing that. No, it was much better than classes, believe me. No, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but usually when a child tries to escape to a sort of imaginary world, it's because they're not particularly content in like the the situation they're in. So. Is that because of your sort of being being different to the other children, or is that because your your parents um, may not have been in a position to give you all the right tools when you were growing up? Is well, you know, uh, 
since uh, uh, I never denied uh, that Jewish part of myself, because my father was a Jew, no, uh, immediately I got discriminated against uh, being a Jew and being the one that killed Christ. I don't know how I did that, but still, no, uh, I was accused of that, no, uh, continuously. So I, I, you know, I preferred books than than playing around with people who might turn around and tell something awful, no, uh, about Jews or about anybody else, no. Yes, and this is interesting because you say your father was in effect an atheist, he was secular. Uh, but of course, there's a, a long Jewish tradition of valuing literature, of reading books. So somehow that, that was instilled in you. Well, you see, being a Jew is, is also a kind of political persona. And uh, uh, if uh, you think about the Jew as a political persona, not as a religious persona, no, then you find out uh, how difficult it was because the Nazis killed all my family, actually, no, uh, uh, from the Hungarian side, no. Hmm? Uh, only uh, his sister and mother uh, survived, uh, only to be sort of tortured by by the Soviets, no, hmm? when they invaded Hungary, hmm? but. You know, it's always a strange kind of entity uh, being one thing or another thing. I, I never felt comfortable, or even now it's difficult, because I, they always relate to me as a, as a foreigner. I'm not a Mexican, no, according to them. And I don't care. I mean, I don't have really a nationality. I won't fight for any country whatsoever. I don't believe in that, no. So I fight for the kind of very small country that is my house. <laughs> no, right. Um, and so Leonora, of course, she came from a wealthy upper middle class industrialist background. Yeah. Um, not Jewish in the least. No. Um, so she must have been very because anti-Semitic tropes and you know prejudice and bigotry were still very much alive. In the first half of the 20th century, you had, of course, the British Union of Fascists. You had so sort of casual anti-Semitic remarks, even in novels and plays and movies. So she must have been very open-minded in that sense to marry a Jewish person. And also, you mentioned that later she got interested in rabbinical texts and sort of um, Jewish pieces of obscure, wonderful literature. So... So was your mother in love, do you think, with Jewish culture before she met your father? Or was it all his fault? Well, she was continuously sort of fishing into different disciplines, yes. you know? And uh, she was interested in Gershom Sholem, and she was interested in Gurdjieff, and she was interested in anybody that would open a door into the unknown, you know? So that's where she, she got her, her uh, working materials, no? Mm -hmm. It was that, uh, that's why maybe she was so interested in crime because uh, darkness also feeds one, no? Mm -hmm. I think there's always a kind of uh, hidden criminal that must be fed. Huh? What do you mean? Well, because if you go into mystery stories, no, you were mentioning Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie and so on and so forth, they nourish you as well. And there is this dark side that uh, if it is sort of disciplined, no, and if it's unable to express itself, then you'll pay a very high cost for that. You'll become a criminal, a real one. Yes, it is interesting. In the, in the book, this was an anecdote that really quite amused me, is you, you write that she was reading a book about a, a, a real-life crime, and she'd almost finished it. And she said, I'll give it to you when I'm finished, when I'm done. 
and you objected and you, you said like this book will have a bad impact on you. And this is a very interesting thought because usually we pretend like people who read a lot naturally are good people. But I, I, would, I would argue that books can have a very bad effect as well. Immoral books will make you more immoral. Um, and, and yet you say that certain books did not have a, this effect on Leonora. Could you maybe explore this a little further? Well, actually, what she was reading at the time was, was uh, Mason family, no? Mm -hmm. Yes, so helter -skelter. This, uh, that's something that is really going to poison you, no? And she was depressed, and she didn't know why she was depressed. So I said, it's this bloody book, so put it down, no? Read something else. Oh, Peter Rabbit. No? <laughs> something else. Huh? But, but there, there is, however, something so sort of enticing and something more interesting about books that deal with complex characters rather than just moralizing stories. I'm sure you'll agree with that. I completely agree. Yeah, but you see, the thing is that uh, there are moments when uh, we are sort of hypnotized by what we're reading and we're horrified, but at the same time we go on and on and on and on until we finish the book, no? And again, as you were saying, we never understand that that kind of literature might be toxic and it's really poisoning me, no? That's a quite a different thing from, say, a mystery story eh? where you know that each one of the characters is, is a narrative character, you know, it's an imaginary character, no? Hmm? Yeah. Now, you were just talking about, and I hope you don't mind because I read the book, and I feel like what you wrote there, that's fixed on the paper. So I encourage everyone to go and buy it and to read it in the library. They can't buy it. Um, but so I, I enjoy more this meandering style of conversation, just having a dialogue with you and seeing where we land. So I, I hope you don't mind. No, no, not at all. No. Um, you were just talking about opening doors to the unknown, which, again, is very, a sort of tempting phrase. One of my favorite artists is Giorgio de Chirico, the metaphysical painter. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel there is affinity in the works, but your mother's works and his works in the sense that they're both trying to reach for something that's not visible, that is beyond the just surface of things. And they also both had a great affinity for horses, as it happens. So my, my question would be, did they ever meet, actually? And did she ever talk about de Chirico's work to you? Yes, well, of course, she admired Kiriko, as uh, one might well do. But, you know, the thing is that Kiriko was was extremely interesting because he created an, uh, a kind of uh, fabulous space. No, He was an architectural designer in that sense. No? Uh, and, and Leonora, I think, was very much inspired by that. So that, in a way, uh, uh, Leonora was, was always very observant about how you deal with space, how you deal with shadows. And, of course, Kiriko uh, was dealing with all that, no? It was shadows and, and how to create a narrative where space is included not excluded. I mean, I can see that there are many painters that just include a house, no? And it's just a bloody house. And there's nothing else but that, a house, no? But with Kiriko, it's different because it's inhabited by also by sort of architectonic creatures, no? That inhabit that space, no? Hmm? So sometimes Leonora would go into that. No. Yes, but so so is this you? Um, is this you saying this, or do you actually re remember her talking about De Chirico and maybe his influence on her? No, 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 no. I'm I'm not even speaking about real influence. I'm speaking about learning about space. Kiriko will teach you about space if you let yourself, you know, understand space. No in that way. 
But I don't know if if Leonora thought in the same way. No, maybe not. But uh, she she would always uh, find very exciting and mysterious what Kiriko was doing with his uh, paintings. No. Hmm? Did she talk about any of the other surrealist artists and maybe about their work? W which ones did she really value? Well, Marguerite, of course, no? Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a moment with Maxence that Maxence was also very interesting, no? And, uh, and but basically, you know, maybe it was them and then... Uh, uh, well, Vilfredo Lama as well, uh, and uh, even if if Leonor Fini was not quite accepted, uh, she was also very interesting in that sense. And not not accepted in what way? As a surrealist, I see. Huh? Hmm. So, it, but it doesn't really matter. No, what Breton in his kind of. Uh, uh, authoritarian way decided who was and who wasn't no uh, is is beside the point no yes well the Chirico talks about this in, in his memoir he uh, at some point he fell out with the surrealists or they fell out with him because he changed his painting style and he talks about really how how that they could be real hooligans for example Jean Cocteau who's like you a, a poet and playwright he supported the Chirico in this matter. And what they did, these surrealists under the leadership of Breton, is they would make very mischievous phone calls to the, I think, the grandmother or the mother of Jean Cocteau mm -hmm. and say that, their, that her grandson died in a horrible car accident. And like things like that were very nasty, really. Um, did, did your mother ever talk about this nastier side of the surrealists or did she only have nice things to say about them? Well, you know, it's like having a, a relationship with friends, no? Sometimes we like the person and sometimes we dislike them. Huh? It depends on the kind of mood we're in or the mood they are in, no? So it's sort of a, a kind of, a, say, developing story, no? Huh? Hmm. But I, I do feel that her relationship with Max Ernst, we should briefly talk about that, I feel, because that was a very, it, it has been talked about maybe too much, but it was nevertheless a very sort of temperamental moment in her life, a very sort of formative moment. She was in her late teens, early 20s when she was with him. Yeah. Um, could, could you maybe tell us, tell the audience what that period of her life was like and how she and Ernst, how they influenced each other and inspired each other and what their relationship was like? Well, you know, it's always very difficult to find a, a creative mate, no? Uh, and I think Leonora found in Max Ernst this uh, friend that... Uh, could be relied upon uh, uh, respecting her creation and at the same time creating with her. No? So, and I think that that uh, the house in Ardesh is very much uh, proof of that. No, that they both made uh, sculptures there, and and my mother painted. Uh, doors in the house and so on. So it was a house that it was alive in 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 creative ideas, no? And that must have been uh, very rewarding for her, no? Uh, this close relationship with somebody that uh, not only understands your creation, but that inspires you in some way, no? Not as influence, because... Again, you know, uh, people always speak about how Max Ernst influenced Leonora, no? Uh, that's bullshit, no? Uh, when you are in a kind of equal ground, uh, no matter the difference of age and so on, uh, you're curious about uh, 
what you can create with the other person. But that's not something you talk about. You just do it, no? Hmm? Yes. Now, you say in the book that Leonora would not reminisce much. She would not reflect constantly on the past. But do you think that when's the, the last time they met, Max Ernst and your mother? That was in the 40s, no? Yes, roughly. Yeah, it was in New York when, uh, when she was already with Renato, huh? And she was about to travel to Mexico. And there's this picture, this group picture of a few surrealists, and there he's mm -hmm. sitting and she's on the floor. Uh, and I feel like his his gaze is a bit awkward. W w would there have been a tension between them? Do you know this? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, there's always tension when one is with somebody else. No, I suppose. No, uh, we have to sort of. Uh, tame our fears before we can speak. You know? Yes. Well, I, I hope there's a good tension going on here. <laughs> good. Yes, thankfully. No? <laughs> But it's not always like that. Not, not everybody is benevolent. So, And we do have benevolent moments and, and some others that are not. No? Where, where we try to attack the other person for some unknown reason or other. No? But Generally, I think they were very happy together when they were together and when the war didn't intervene, no? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, but after that, of course, she didn't have that anymore because your father was, of course, a wonderful man. I mean, that's very clear, but he was a photographer, not, not a painter, as I understand. So she didn't really have that same person to bounce off her ideas anymore. Do you think you might have become that person for her? Well, I'm not a painter, no. But uh, the thing is, is that uh, uh, somehow, you know, uh, but my father worked with her when she was uh, uh, doing the tapestries, no? And uh, he would collaborate with things, no? He was very open to, to collaborate, and Leonora would accept that immediately, no? Hmm? So... Uh, But I think that the relationship with Max Hanst indeed was different. It was different because somehow there was this mirroring, this creative mirroring that maybe she did not have with my father. No? Mm? Yes. Uh, would she ever talk in her later life about Max Ernst to you or friends? Did you ever hear her drop his name? No. Never. Never. The last time they met was in the 40s and she died in 2011 and she never mentioned her former lover again. Or oh, very, very rarely. I mean, in a very sort of circumstantial manner. But uh, it was very traumatic for her, you know. Uh, and, and she preferred not to speak about that. It was like my, with my father. He preferred not to speak about the concentration camp, you know, in Morocco. It was better to forget those things, you no? Know? And since she had a very close relationship with, with Max and she was very much in love with Max, when that broke, something very dear broke in, in herself. Mm -hmm. Something that would never be restored never ever now towards the end of her life of course I presume you were having discussions with her about her life uh, maybe you were even planning on writing a book already or even subconsciously uh, so I, I presume that you would have tried her to open up about her life is this true did you try to do this and how successful were your attempts No, because at the time I was not thinking of writing the book. You see, I thought, of, I thought maybe it would be better to write about what uh, happened, no? Uh, but then she was not present. She was not there. And I could not ask what she thought about this or that. I could just remember some of the conversations we had, no? Mm -hmm. 
Huh? Each Tuesday, I would go visit her and we would have lunch together. No, no matter what. And, uh, uh, well, most of those conversations were part of what the book is about, no? And yeah. life, of course, no? Yeah. Life, life is an experience, no? Well, you mentioned lunch. Um, one of the things I got from the book is that she was a very talented and so very creative cook, and she could serve all kinds of dishes. And I, I also gather that chestnut cream was a, a thing that is a re recurring red threat through your life. Um, ah, yes, yes. The yes? crème de marron. Hmm? Well, maybe you could share some of the recipes that Leonora Carrington made made for you. Well, f you had to, uh, first of all, boil the, the chestnuts and then you open them and then you would mash them and you'd put uh, vanilla and you'd put sugar uh, and, and cream. And that was it, no? Yes. Uh, But she would also like create very sort of monstrous figures, wouldn't she? Um, ah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. That that was for Edward James. It was a dinner <laughs> that she offered Edward James. So, so she created a kind of monstrous fish, no? Huh? Yes. To, to serve as as a special kind of monstrous dinner. No, just for the viewers, Ad Edward James was this great connoisseur of the surrealist movement, and he was also a patron. Um, and and he, he's the one in the famous portrait, right, where he's looking into the mirror, but his reflection is also looking away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, That's exactly Edward James. Yeah. And Edward James, he he purchased he purchased a, a lot of your mother's works. Do do you know if he did? Yes, he did. Yeah, and that's how we were able to live, <laughs> because nobody else really uh, recognized Leonora until much, much later. No. Huh? So, so what were his thoughts about Leonora? What, what did he say when he was sitting around your table? And w would he would he talk about her art? Would he like no. make comments? No. 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 Never. No. No, that, no, and whenever he did, he he got uh, you know really pushed aside. No, by yeah. Leonora, he got rebuked. Yeah, but well, she didn't want to to hear his opinions about that. No, <laughs> uh, she wanted to keep the friendship flowing. Uh, you know, and to speak about art would have been very. Yes. Unadvisable, no. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I, I am an art historian as well as sort of in my small way an artist. I try to paint and draw, and what I've noticed when I'm with artists is that they are very grateful towards the people who buy their art, but they can also talk about them in a terrible way because these are people they don't know what they're talking about. They've never picked up a brush themselves, so they shouldn't be commenting on us. Is this very much an attitude that Leonora had as well? No, uh, she considered, you see, art as something absolutely private. Huh? So uh, the, her relationship with, with the painting was, was a very uh, subjective and profound kind of liaison. Huh? So uh, uh, the, uh, a stranger if a stranger would sort of trespass, no, huh, then it's something that she didn't like and, and she would push this stranger out of her inner circle to, to, to speak about that, no? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if, if, we, um, if we both close our eyes and we try to picture her little room in the house, because it wasn't very, very big, right? Her, her workshop, her atelier. Um, if, if you walk into that room, what did it look like? Was it just an easel? What, can you describe it to us? No, no. As you say, it was always very small. Leonora's studios were very small. It was not like Diego Rivera, who has a huge room and so on. Uh, and so I, I'm not going to speak about Diego, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, did you did you meet Diego? Yes. And what, yes. What, what was that like? Well, it was very strange because he was immensely fat. Huh? 
So I saw this kind of Buddha-like creature, no, that scarcely said hello. So that was my my impression of Diego, no. Hmm? So a bit antisocial then. Well, he was not very communicative at the time, no. Who yes. knows what kind of mood he was in, no. But, but did you meet Frida then? No, 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 no never. No, no. Um, and would it just be like, um, would it be Diego on his own or would he always be with a, a group of friends who visited your mother? He did not visit my mother. We went to visit him once. Huh? Right. How old were you? I must have been around 10 or 11. Okay. Hmm? You you must have thought him a very interesting individual. Um. <laughs> well, no, no, I, because I was completely ignorant of what he really was. You know, just Leonora said, "Well, you know, that's Diego," and that was it. No, yeah. Then, then I more or less understood what he was about, but only later on. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Diego was famous for his murals, and so your your mother's place was quite small, and you know, relatively. Yes, yes. Well, she was uh, she was not a muralist at all. No, huh? so she uh, went very much into the kind of Renaissance kind of miniatures in a way. No, yes. So, so it was just the opposite. No. So could you could you describe that room for us where she worked? Well, yes, uh, it was actually a very uh, special kind of room because it was full of of plants of creepers, you know. So it gave very much a kind of uh, uh, peculiar atmosphere to the studio, but not intended. No. It was, she just liked plants, and she had some of the plants in the studio. And since there was a bit more light, no, and they were shielded from the rain and so on, she had them in the studio, no. And, and well, uh, it was mostly a, a very sort of a stark place, no. It had a The, there wasn't really a table. It was a kind of a cement slab where she kept all sorts of uh, pots and tubes of paint and so on. No? Yeah. And then, of course, her easel. That was an easel. This is an easel. No? Uh, and a chair. Uh, and, and that was it. No? And pigments here and there. Uh, and... Uh, It, it was rather hot studio. Uh, for some unknown reason, you know, the architect decided that it was a good idea to have the place completely windowless, practically. So you had to open a door that gave to a, a, to a kind of backyard. There were some stairs, there were some, you know, iron stairs. That would take you down to the backyard, huh? where we kept a very ferocious Doberman, no? who would growl like, you know, one of these mythical creatures while he was feeding. No? So he would make the most unpleasant little noises down there. No? So, and, and Leonora, you know, was, was there in her studio, no? But, but she would use the studio only when she was sort of painting. Most of the time she would use her, her living room, no? And she would draw there. Or she would plan uh, how the painting was going to be distributed and how the figures were going to be there and so on, no? And, and were those horrid noises the only noises in the place? Did she work in absolute silence? Yeah, well, whenever the neighbors were not growling at each other, no? <laughs> right. And so were you or anyone else allowed to disturb her or ask questions or talk with her whilst she was working? Or did she really lock herself up and did she insist on having her own private time? No, she was very open. You know, she was not... 
she didn't consider this as a kind of sacred activity. So one could go in and play in the same room and, you know, it was understood that she was working and that one should uh, entertain oneself with whatever was available, no, without interrupting her. But that was it, no? But she never insisted upon that. She was very open and, and, and she considered her art as part of her life, not as something sacred where there must have, uh, that she had to have silence around her and everybody should respect that place and so on and so forth. No, hmm? it was not like that. And, and so, of course, she's known as a sort of um, pioneer in feminism in, in Mexico in that time. How were the household chores distributed between your father and your mother? Could you repeat that again, please? Because you were cut. Oh, sure thing. Your voice um, was cut. Because you were already talking about that she loved to cook. So she, she presumably she would have spent a lot of time in the kitchen. And I was just wondering, given that she was such a, she's been regarded as such a feminist figure, how were the household chores, uh, the little tasks in the house, how were they distributed? Did your mother do most of the sort of cleaning up or did your father also help out? No, we all had to help out. I mean, hmm. there was no, no, uh, you know, activity that was centered in in Leonora as a, uh, as you know, as a woman in the kitchen and so on. That did not happen because my father was rather a good cook, and we learned to cook as well. So it was kind of activities were well sort of distributed around, no? Hmm? Yes. Now, could you, maybe, could you maybe talk a little bit about the spiritual side of your mother? So was she always interested in like things like the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Or is it something that emerged later in her life, this interest? No, she was very interested always in, in say, first fairy tales and then you know, she would go into, into Gurdjieff, Spensky, Suzuki, you know, and, and well, uh, also Faridu di Natar, for example, no, uh, the Conference of the Birds, and, and many other things, you know, subjects were always uh, coming alive in, in her. In, in in her library, you know. Hmm? Hmm? Did, did she tell you if she had any recurring dreams, any visions that haunt? Because you talk about your own dreams in the book. For example, that you you dreamt of having to go back to high school, even though you were already at college. Things like that. Did she talk about her dreams at all? Yeah, no, that was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> nightmare. Yes, <laughs> that's a distinction. Yes, yes. Oh yes, 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 very much. So. Well, did, did she talk about her night uh, dreams or her nightmares? No, uh, you know she would write down her dreams because that was very important for her, so that she would go back to them as a kind of uh, dialogue between her unconscious and herself. That was the way she could somehow communicate with that side of herself, no? But her paintings uh, did not come out of dreams, but out of visions. It's different. You see? Yeah, I, I'm would, aware of that, yeah. Hmm. She would go into this kind of hypnagogic state, and then visions would come to her, uh, and, and, and she would... Uh, you know, she she would quickly make a sketch or something so as not to forget what it was all about. And then they became part of her paintings, no? Hmm? Yes, and in this book you say that these states that she, she got herself into, they were never induced by drugs. No. So, no. so how how did she bring herself to be in a state where she could have these great visions and then transport them onto the canvas? 
Well, it's a kind of meditation. You see my point. You, you have to still the outer world, no? And try to look into what is happening uh, within yourself, no? I hesitate to call it mind because we sort of over-rely on that, no? Huh? Yes, that's. but that must have been tough if she had like children running around making noises to, to get into the meditative state. Well, then she would choose a moment when we were asleep, <laughs> no? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I see. Hmm. So it was always, you know, adapting to, to whatever life was, no? Uh, she would all, all, all also have, was subjected to cowboy films and things like that, no? But then I suppose that she would go to another place, mentally speaking, <laughs> no? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, one anecdote that I liked from the book was there's a hot evening, and I think you're in Italy, and you remove a sculpture that both you and your mother refer to as the white goddess. It's an ivory sculpt, 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 sculpture uh, from your neck, and you place it somewhere else. And then you have a dream or a nightmare um, about this the sculpture. And, and she says to you, objects have different ways of inhabiting our beings, but you should feel fortunate. You received a gift from your unconscious. Did she receive a lot of gifts from her unconscious? Well, definitely. I mean, she had to work with that unconscious a lot. I mean, that was her main tool, aside of the brushes and so on and so forth, no? It was trying to contact that which is a, a kind of inner teacher, no? Hmm? So, uh, uh, yes, uh, there was this kind of very active imagination, no? Uh, and communication with the imaginative uh, realms. And one of those imaginative realms belongs to the unconscious, no? So she was continuously trying to, to inhabit that, to inhabit the painting uh, uh, in order to paint it, or to inhabit her characters while she was writing, no? Hmm? Do you think it became harder for her to inhabit those realms and those characters as she got older? Yes, well, everything becomes a bit more difficult when one becomes older, huh? I suppose. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, hmm. yes well, you have, to, uh, you have to deal with the kind of journey you're going to make, which is death, no? You have yes. to you have to prepare for that, no? So uh, uh, somehow uh, create creativity is subjected to a certain point to an external kind of media uh, and not this kind of inner world that you have to inhabit in order to die, no? Yes, and 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 there is this recurring theme in her work that she reflects on her childhood traumas or her teenage, her teenage years. And you talk about the story that she wrote the story of a young woman who wanted to take on the form of a hyena to avoid the embarrassment and suffering of a deputant ball in England. Um, did this suffering that, that, that she must have felt at that time, did that fade at a certain point or was it always with her, even to her dying days? Well, it, it was this feeling of not belonging that she was asked to participate in this kind of very Victorian atmosphere, no? Mm -hmm. uh, that was considered an honor, not for her. And then uh, that was difficult. No, but uh, that did not make her a kind of a, uh, an anti-social person at all. She was very much uh, interested in 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 society, no, uh, and having friends and so on. No, so 
that's how I think she dealt with people as well. No, mm -hmm. right. Now, we, uh, before we go to the questions, is there anything in the book that you are unsatisfied with? Because it was originally published in 2021. So there's been a few years, you know, since you've written the book. Um, do, is there anything you would change or which you think deserved more attention? Well, you know how it is, no? A, a book is, is never finished, no? So um, ideas come and memories come. And I always say, well, I wish I would have mentioned this or that, no? Huh? But the moment is gone somehow, no? The book is already out, no? It yeah. belongs to itself. It doesn't belong to 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 me anymore, no? No, it's, it, it belongs to the public now, to the world. Yes, yes, yes. And people can do a lot of things or, or not, who or just think that... Uh, the book is unreadable and they just said it this way. No, well, I'm sure people didn't say that to you. I'm sure that's not been a critique. <laughs> but, you know, I wanted, there was one of your questions. Yes, I'll go to the question. But before we do that, what I actually really wanted to know is if you could go back and meet your mother one, one more time, uh, what's something about her life that you really want to know but she never told you about? Like, what would you ask her? Well, what you were um, mentioning earlier on, no, uh, maybe I would have liked her to speak a bit more about uh, her relationship with Max Sells, for example. No? Hmm? That no. would have been highly interesting as far as I'm concerned. No? But what would you ask her specifically about that relationship? Well, uh, the way they created together, what sort of uh, conversations they had, or if they were completely silent when they were doing these things. Uh, and how was her life in, in Ardèche in general? No, It's sort of uh, very difficult to know how it was, no? because we only have... Uh, what other people speak about, no? Huh? Uh, there's a book by a French woman, now I forget uh, her name, but it was about Max and Leonora. But, uh, you know, again, it's something that is sort of uh, once removed, no? How old were you when you learned that they had a relationship together? Well, it was not a secret that my mother kept at all, no? It was quite open, huh? but uh, but she didn't speak about it. it you, you, know, you never thought of going to Max Ernst or to one of their mutual friends and, and to ask them about this? No. Hmm. No, well, first of all, because at the time I was either very busy with my studies, no? Huh? Yeah. Uh, that kept me very busy, uh, so, so it was very difficult to do that. I know? see. Now, we, we've got seven exciting questions, which we, we, we ask to every guest. And I think you have some very interesting answers for us. So the first question is, what is one book that everyone should read, according to you? The Hearing Trumpet. <laughs> By your mother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why The Hearing Trumpet and not Down Below or any of her other works? Well, because I feel that uh, uh, she wrote The Hearing Trumpet uh, when she was very sort of happy. And uh, and I feel that is a very good book for that kind of thing because uh, all her sense of humor comes out and and it's very important to, to see how Leonora played with a very dark sense of humor, no? Hmm? Is that what you like about the book? The sort of very slightly cruel black humor? Yes, definitely. <laughs> huh? Yes, yes. I think it doesn't make other people laugh, but it makes me laugh a lot. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I've got to admit, I, I have not read that book yet, so I, I would definitely do so. 
Oh, um, yes, I recommend it. If you want to have a good laugh. No? <laughs> yes, yes. No, I love a good laugh. And I will let you know how much I laughed when I read it. Um, <laughs> the second question is, apart from your mother, who's your favorite artist and why? Well, that is a very difficult question because, you know... I would, I would think, I was very impressed by Delvaux, for example, no? extremely impressed. I, I felt that the way he's treating these female figures in such a mysterious way, it gives me the sense of, of the dream, of the dream world, no? and the dream bodies. So, so that's why I was. I think so much taken by Delvaux, no? Yes, and and in Delvaux's work, there's a lot of classical architecture as well. There's this atmosphere of mystery, women in togas, and what would have you. Um, it, it is, in a sense, similar to your mother's work, but it's also very different. Yes, no, it's totally different. I think no, because uh, somehow when Leonora would would depict women, those women were very uh, somehow undefined. Huh? So they belonged to different uh, genders. Huh? And they were floating, they were nearest to the hermaphrodite than to a real woman or a real man. She would play around with that. No? Oh, and why was there this androgynous aspect, this non-binary aspect to her work? Is it because she wanted to keep things vague so that multiple interpretations were possible? No, because she wanted to inhabit both sides of her masculine and female side, no? So uh, the way to inhabit them was to have creatures that would speak the truth in that sense, no? Hmm? And and Delvaux, when he draws a woman, it's a woman, no? Oh, yes, yes. Most That's very true. Sorry? Hmm. I, I say most definitely. Mm, no? Most definitely, yes. So uh, question number three, what's your favorite painting and why? Well, uh, Again, you know, it was here, this one, no? Yes. I don't know if you can observe it's, it's it. It's also, also in your book, yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, I like it very much because uh, I find that, that, that animals are really communicating with, with the mythical, no? Uh, environment and with space, uh, since you're interested in space, no, and in architecture, I think this is one of of Leonora's uh, works on space, eh? on uh, making the horses uh, extremely solid and sort of spectral at the same time. So that's what I like very much about the painting. And she very much related to animals and she would paint herself as a hyena or as a horse. Yeah. But you, you've taken that over from her because the book is filled with comparisons to animals. And you also, you, you, you seem to have had a very great fondness of horses. Uh, how, how come you, you, were, you looked so much yeah, like your mother? Never... <clears throat> yeah, I never had a horse, which she had, no? Yeah. So... She had a very personal kind of communication with that horse while she was in England, no? Hmm? Uh, and for me, the, the horse is very much a, of a kind of living energy. If I would have to depict this living energy, I, I would think of a horse, no? Yes. What kind of living energy do you think I am? A fox, an anteater. <laughs> uh, let me see. 
an octopus. <laughs> Why? Why is that? Well, just I mean, there's a kind of a uh, a kind of floating entity, no, that is very important because you know I was I very much enjoyed a film uh, that had to do with an octopus. I don't know if you saw it. It's in iTube or something like that, or YouTube or however they call it. No. Uh, and the the relationship between the diver and the octopus is is quite unique no so i think it's a, an animal that that is not very well understood huh? so yes and i feel so misunderstood myself uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. in an octopus way hmm? yes exactly um w- w- what about yeah, I, um, yes, I, I don't want to get too personal, but like the people around you. So, for example, you talk that you did love your son Daniel, your younger son, did a lot of research for the book, and he's be, he's played a very important part in building the website and in sort of continuing keeping uh, Leonora's legacy alive. So, I feel a bit more comfortable about asking about him. What kind of animal would he be? Uh, well, Danny is in love with cheetahs, so so it would be a cheetah, huh? Yes, definitely, because he was he was working with cheetahs in in South Africa, and and he wow. enjoyed that moment very much. No, hmm? I see. Very interesting this connection between your mother's work and animals, and and your relationship to animals. Again, it, there's there's wonderful parts about this in your book, so I recommend everyone to go and read it. Um, what is your favorite piece of architecture? Gaudi. Ah, so you, you would love Barcelona, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very much taken by Barcelona, but especially I went to Barcelona to 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 see the the garden and, and, and the cathedral and so on, no? I was very much taken by that. No. What about his architecture? Do you like the playfulness? Well, it, that that yes, the playfulness most definitely. But the way that that he brings the marvelous into architecture, no, he doesn't deny that uh, uh, side of 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 architecture. It's very much like like the Chateau de 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 de. Cheval, uh, uh, I don't know if you you know that uh, that thing that the Facteur Cheval uh, built in, in it's near France. I mean near near Paris. I mean no, mm-hmm. well not that near maybe Grenoble. No, so but uh, it's, a, it's an interesting comparison. Well, it, they're both uh, manifestations of a very intense inner life, no? Huh? Uh, which I think is is a, a language, and that language is something very much present with the factor Cheval, and very much present in in Gaudi as well, no? Yes, yeah. and of course that playfulness, I think. In some ways, architecture reached a peak in Art Nouveau and Art Deco before the First and Second World Wars. Do you, do you think? What do you think of modern architecture then? Ah, there you foxed me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There are things that I enjoy, no, but there are other uh, kind of buildings that I feel are extremely pretentious, no? that, that they want to make a statement. And uh, I'm, I'm very much, you know, wary of those statements. There are too many of them, no? Did, did, Leonor- did Leonora have like um, a lot for architecture as well? Would you like point out things? in the street or maybe sculptures if you walk down the street does she have like a i feel like she would have a lot of attention for small details uh, 
Yes, well, she enjoyed, you know, uh, uh, sort of houses that were maybe uh, built in the 1900s, you know, in Mexico, because there was sort of, uh, uh, they had a personality. And what I find that most of the modern architecture is devoid of that. It has the personality of the architect but it doesn't allow for anything else, no? There's mm. no place for anything else. No, many no. buildings are just very nondescript nowadays. Um, yes. So th this is my favorite question. Number five, what is a realization that really changed your life or career? Feminism. Elaborate, please. Well, I learned... Uh, a new vocabulary, no? Uh, in order to to respect the female in a way that I was not aware that it was necessary, no? And it made me into another person and it changed my views and my ways of teaching and so on. Hmm? So I think that was uh, very powerful. No. So as how a, how old? Sorry. No. Yeah. How how old were you when this realization came? And was it thanks to your mother, or was it thanks to reading Simone de Beauvoir and Germaine Greer and things like that? Well, I, yes, I think it it was also my mother. No, but for example, I was giving classes at uh, at. Uh, Catholic Institute, and I was thrown out because uh, I, I decided to speak about women and not theater, which I was supposedly I was I was a theater teacher, and I decided to go into a completely different environment. <laughs> if you see my point, no. yes. And so the husbands were... were not very happy, and they, you know, they had to kick me out. <laughs> you were punished for it. I was punished, yeah. Yes. Um, what is a quote that you really like? Oh, so I have it here. Huh? Great. People under 70 and over seven are very unre unreliable if they're not cats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, and the, the final question that I have Who's the most brilliant or interesting person you've ever met? Sorry. Cool. Hello? It's at the, yes, I hello. got disconnected. I'm sorry. Okay. So the final question that I have for you uh, is, who's, well, who's the Aldous most Huxley. brilliant? Aldous Huxley. So, of course, Huxley was the author of A Brave New World. He a very well-known, yeah. respected novelist. What about him struck you? Well, I don't know. He had this kind of uh, inner quietness that I respect very much. And I feel that this inner quietness is... Uh, a way of dealing with your own intelligence. That was I it. See. That was the impression that he gave. Hmm? I, I know a lot of quiet people and they don't all stri strike me as geniuses. Ah, well, but that doesn't mean that they're working with their intelligence, no? Hmm? Of course, he had a very sort of striking physiognomy, didn't he? He had a very high forehead, sort of combed back hair, quite an ascetic thin face. Did did that contribute, or was this was it his discussion, his thoughts that you heard at the table uh, that 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 made you really respect him? Well, you know, at the time when when I I met him, he was completely blind. So uh, that was something that. Uh, uh, creates a, 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 an impression, no? Hmm. But at the same time, 
you imagine that this person can explore his own thoughts in a better way than we that can see and can observe things are able to do it because we take uh, everything for granted. <clears throat> and I don't think that uh, he was in that position at all. He was a friend of Edward's, as you probably know. Huh? So it was Edward that brought Aldous Huxley to the house. And uh, 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 well, we had lunch with him and so on. But wh what was most important was was the way that he behaved, no? Huh? And and this behavior, I think, always shows a part of one that uh, one is not very much aware of, hmm? but that it tells a lot of things about you. Do you remember the kind of things that Leonora and he would discuss over the table? No. W would they talk about literature or would they talk about politics? No, they would speak about <clears throat> all sorts of different subjects, but n nothing very serious, no? Mm. Okay. And a question that I just have to ask now that you mentioned Huxley, whose vision of the current world would be more accurate? Orwell's 1984 or Huxley's Brave New World? <laughs> uh, well, it's that I think that uh, both Orwell depicts uh, 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 a very specific political environment, no, that uh, must be understood in order to to conceive what modern politics is like, and Brave New World, I think, is far more. <clears throat> a kind of political biology, if you see my point. Huh? Yes. Yes. But you're not answering fully my question. So you, you are just... That would you're be out, the same. Out, the outlining the main, the main difference. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, very good. Sorry, um, I can't hear you. Yeah, I, I was saying that that is very fair, and I, I agree with that. But, but looking... And you're a very well-read person, and looking at today's society... Whose vision do you think is closer? Oh, uh, well, I, I think, for example, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, no, I think, have a very acute vision of the world, no, of our modern world, no. Mm. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry, I, I just could not resist. Okay, <laughs> so we we have a few questions from the audience. And one from Andrea, and she writes, and you, you sort of answer this in your book, but she writes, at home in Mexico, did they only speak Spanish or did they also speak some English or Hungarian from his, your father? Did she tell him stories like the Irish fairy tales she knew from her nanny? Well, Leonora, yes, and especially when we were in England, no, she would invent stories about... Uh, you know, the forest and so on and so forth, no? Uh, my father uh, would speak in French, not in Hungarian at all. N no Hungarian. He disliked Hungarians enormously, no? Especially because of the anti-Semitic policy of Horty, no? At the time. And he had to leave Hungary, let's not forget that. And then Spanish, no? So it was Spanish, English, French, basically, no? Yes. Uh, and what kind of fairy tales would your mother tell you when you went to bed? Well, about the little people, no? Uh, and, the, and the banshees, no? And the leprechauns, that sort of thing, no? <laughs> How charming. It was, it was very busy, <laughs> Uh, now, now, Michael has a question, um, which I understand is it, interesting. Is uh, What did your mother think of Salvador Dali, and did she ever meet him or work with him? Uh, he never, uh, well, she never met him, but Salvador Dali uh, admired Leonora, as far as I know. No? Uh, 
and and she thought Dali was interesting. No, there were moments when he was uh, when he was very interesting. Not in his politics, though. Hmm? Especially when he decided to to back Franco. No, uh, and that was very unfortunate. No. Yes. And there's another question here from Hannah, and she says, given that your mother grew up in quite a privileged so background, do you think she, like, I'll, I'll rephrase the question because it's worded a bit strangely. Do you think that your mother um, was, that she thought it was a shame that she could not give that kind of privilege to you? Or did you also have a very so pleasant, easy oh. life um, when you, when she lived with with you as a family, because living as an artist is is not easy, I suppose, because you've got to find p patrons and people to buy your artwork, and she of course grew up in a very affluent family. Well, Mexico was not at all like that. No, I mean, uh, uh, we were more on the sort of poor side than, mm. than the affluent one. No, right. so uh, life there w w was uh, there were. We were not deprived of anything, but it was not the kind of life that she lived in England, no, mm. where where the property was enormous and that sort of thing disappeared in Mexico. No, it was completely different. No, yes. Now, just on that, because just for per, you know purely selfish reasons, I'm going to ask you one final question. There, a friend of mine and I, we've been thinking of moving either to Argentina or Brazil or maybe even Mexico, he speaks Spanish rather well, um, buy a sort of nice 19th century house or mansion and live very comfortably. Uh, do you think Mexico would be the right place? Or uh, what is it like living in Mexico now? Well, it's difficult. It's a very complex city. I mean, it can be very violent, no? Uh, and uh, one has to always be careful. So, um, but it's an interesting city, no? At the same time, but I don't know. Living in 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 London, sometimes uh, it can be dangerous as well, no? True. Huh? So, uh, it's it's a very complex city, no? Yes. And and Argentina, I don't know. Uh, Brazil, I think, is extremely interesting. No, I've been to to Brazil, and I was basically in the Bayan uh, area of Brazil. I thought that people were very amiable and so on. But then I was there like a tourist. Here okay. I am. I'm here. Uh, I. In, uh, as a citizen in Mexico, and that makes things very different, no? Hmm? Yes, yes, that's very true. As Oscar Wilde would say, familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. And on that note, I would like to thank Professor Weiss Carrington for coming on. It's been a very interesting, so easygoing conversation. I, I enjoyed it very much. I hope he did as well. Um, is there anything you're working on at the moment and where can my viewers find you? Well, we just uh, uh, finished uh, a book on the tarot, uh, and uh, it was beautifully sort of illustrated by by Leonora's uh, tarot cards. No, this was published uh, uh, by Fulgur Press, and 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 uh, they they did wonderful uh, kind of printing work no it was it's a very beautiful book if you just hold on for two seconds i can show you uh, oh, please yes fantastic it.
Ah, lo tienes, tienes el de el de Sean. Wow, this has turned into a live unpackaging video. Oh, yes. Those are very popular on YouTube, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry. So oh, we, like we're suddenly getting more viewers. They're loving this. That's a beautiful book. Wow. Well, and uh, then there were some cards, no? But I won't show you the whole thing, but I'll show you just one or two. Let me see. Can you see it? I Yeah, I can see it. That's very nice. Wow. That's a very high quality print. Print, yeah. Yeah, and then there were the cards, no, as well. But then, you know, huh? uh, the tarot cards as well, of course. So when is this coming on, on the market, this book? Well, I think it's already there, no? Okay. And maybe maybe they're making another set as well yes huh? it's because this was sold out i think no huh? i'll be i'll be sharing a link to the to to where they could potentially buy it under the video uh so miriam writes a very interesting interview with a very kind writer about a very special surrealistic painter mother thank you so much i became very curious and i'm definitely going to read the book about leonora carrington That's I, where the cards are in, no? Oh, wonder, that's 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 just very, very luxurious uh, packaging. I love it. And the cards, you know, are sort of very nice too because, you, let me see, that's the... Yes, I can see it. Oh, card, no? I think I think you've made Leonora very proud. That's that's great. <laughs> Thank you very you much. And there's another comment here. If you don't mind, there's uh, Alejandra. She, she asks, Hi, I was wondering if Leonora met Cesar Moro and Wolfgang Palen. Yes. Yes, she did. Huh? Uh, they yes. were both friends and they came to visit and so on. No? Uh, yeah, no? yeah. Do you remember this? When, like, when was this? Cesar Moro, well, she illustrated some of her, some of his his, his poems and so on. And with Palin, well, of course, she was very close to Palin. No? Hmm? I see. Very good. Now, we are moving away next week from sunny Mexico to cold Moscow, Russia, because next Thursday I'll be interviewing Professor Robin Milner Gulland about one of the most significant medieval Russian icon painters ever. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, Gabriel, very much. And I'll be back next week. So thank you for your time and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Party. Party.